You need people like me so you can point your fucking fingers. I say that's the bad guy. Oh, I'm always the bad guy. Well, not recently for some unknown reason. This is Tim's New York Giants Straight Talk. Powered by Online Big Blue LLC. Want to talk about John Mara? Want to talk about the New York Giants? Want to talk about George Steinbrenner? We, we were having a conversation on the live stream yesterday. And um, also want to talk about the Washington game a little bit. We had a conversation on the live stream yesterday. Uh, and actually, it was a pretty good conversation. If you didn't watch it, go, go back and watch some of it. And I was talking about Wellington Mara. I've had the opportunity to, to meet Wellington Mara back in the 80s, um, especially when my father, I've mentioned before, did some work with Wellington. So I spent some time around MetLife. Well, it wasn't MetLife. It was the Meadowlands back then. Um, so, you know, I never, I never really could I never would say I personally knew the man because I was young at the time, but I did get the opportunity to meet him. You could, you could feel the aura sometimes about Wellington that he just was this wealth of knowledge and he had this ability to, to communicate. And... You know, John takes over. You still win. You win some championships. Yes, 100%. You can't deny that completely. But you have been sitting in the doldrums forever now. And people have discussed the fact that maybe the Maras need to sell their portion of the team because people seem, sometimes people forget that uh, the Tishes own, I believe, 49% of the Giants as well. Um, I forget the exact percentage. But, you know, the, the Maras no longer have total control of the team like they used to where it was, it was literally a family business. It was like the Roonies and, and you always compare the giants and the Steelers and the bears as, as these cornerstone franchises of the NFL as, as the pinnacle of what you want it to be. Well, we haven't been that in a long time and you've gone through multiple head coaching regimes. You've gone through multiple multitudes of general managers and you've gone through multitudes of free agents and bad draft choices and bad quarterbacks or one bad quarterback, I should say. And you've kind of reached a pinnacle and point where you're like, you, you continuously point your fingers at the bad guy and it's usually the head coach. And then it's usually the general manager. But we, and, and recently in the last couple of years, people have been saying that willing uh, Wellington, John or the Maras need to sell the team because you know, this Mara run organization right now is, is not going in the right direction. Now meddling owners are usually always the problem. You, you, you look at the likes of uh, you know, you look at, look, look at the likes in Dallas, Jerry Jones, you know, he, he runs the team at times like a fan. He's, he's, he succeeded or succeeded a little bit of control to, you know, to, you know, to a lot of people within the organization in reference to making football decisions, but he still has this fan mentality and you can tell that he wants to win at, at all costs. Sometimes you run into owners where you can tell they just want to win. I'm not saying that the Maras don't want to win. I'm not saying that whatsoever, but you can just kind of reach this pinnacle where you're like, okay, it, it, you're, you're at a point right now where you got to do something different. You got, you got to be, we've said, be, you know, we've said it before, be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. And you have to start point, pointing fingers at ownership. Now I'm not saying this is Don Sterling type thing with the Clippers where you have to sell the team, but you got to look at it from the whole perspective of what the, what's going on here. At the end of the day, yes, any general manager you bring in is a general manager, but the buck always stops with the owner because the owner is the one that writes the checks. And at the end of the day, are we really looking at talent? Are we really looking at the ability to bring in players from an ownership level that will help this team not only be competitive but win again? And while we talk about the fact that it's a bad thing to have that fan mentality, it's also – probably something that's not a, that you should probably have because of the fact I always go back to George, George Steinbrenner, George Steinbrenner back. I think it was in 73 bought the Yankees. You know, he, he ran, he ran that organization at times. Like he was a fan. He won early in the seventies. He made the series in 81. He, he just, he just had this, he just had this, uh, this, this, this drive in him to make this team, the best. You could tell that he loved the Yankees. You could tell 
that the Yankees were his team. While he was a shipping magnet, you could tell that George, his, his passion was always New York sports was always the Yankees. Yes. He fired and rehired uh, Billy Martin. What? Like five times. He, he did some stupid things, you know, out of the ordinary that he probably shouldn't have as an owner. He said things that he shouldn't have, but at the end of the day, you could always tell his mindset was, I want this team to win. Now the Yankees did have uh, they were in the doldrums a little bit in the eighties. You know, it, it was one of those things that, you know, he, he just really couldn't, you know, get over the hump. He, he tried to buy championships. And a lot of times we said that before buying championships doesn't work and it really hurt the team. It really hurt the team a lot. But at the end of the day, you know, he still went out and dropped uh, 23 million on Dave Winfield for those 10 years, which was then was the highest uh, paid player ever. You know, he, he, then he had, then he basically had ride Winfield <laughs> for, for not performing well. And he, he just ran the organization like a fan. And it wasn't until the, uh, it wasn't until that he brought in the likes of baseball guys to run his organization. Did, did he really move the needle to a different direction? But at the end of the day, everything still ran through George. Everything was, everything was still his, his, it it was still his baby. You think back in 2008, when the Yankees ended their postseason run at that time, when I finished, I think there was a third place finish in the East. And then they come back in 2009 and beat the Phillies in the world series to win their 27th championship. That would be seven championships under the Steinbrenner ownership that the Yankees had. They went on to the series in what? 89, 99 and 2000. Then they fell short of their fourth straight title in 2001 with that seven game loss against Arizona. But at the end of the day, George's passion wasn't just baseball. It was the Yankees. And I always think to myself, does Mara have that same passion for the giants? Hard knocks, like I said, was the was the worst window into the giant organization that they could possibly have. They should have closed the blinds because of the fact that you watched this and you were kind of like, yeah, this team, this, 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 uh, this is a little dysfunctional in here. You have a general manager who's more un- that's more interested in eating crustables than he is at time and bringing in Brian Burns as he is at looking at the quarterback position. You have his subordinates, what he does in reference to Shane, in reference to uh, subordinates, he doesn't seem to want to take their opinions on. He doesn't listen to the coach. You know, you could tell he didn't listen to the coaching staff at times about what they needed. And then you have the owner who comes in, you know, and and tells people, you know, he looks dejected and says, hey, listen, if Saquon goes to Philly, I'm going to lose sleep at night. But you didn't also as the owner, and and this is kind of what I was thinking about with the Mara, we always talk about Mara being meddling. Hard Knocks showed a little bit that he's not because if Steinbrenner wanted a player and wanted that player on the team and wanted that player to be part of the Yankees, he went out and did it. He went out and got it done. He told his guys, go get this done. And that's what they would do. They would go out. They would go out and get it done. So if at the end of the day, you have the, your face of your franchise. You have your, your, your player that has this explosiveness, this player that has been this good soldier for you. And you're going to lose sleep. If he goes with to a division rival, even though your general manager misread the market and exactly, and that's exactly where he ended up as the owner, you have the cachet to sit there and say, sign him, make it happen, figure it out. And I'm not saying they should have did that with Saquon, but what I am saying is this, they need to do something. The owner needs to step in now and kind of just say, listen, this is not working. This hasn't worked now for years. You had one playoff appearance when you started seven and two, but then finished two, five and one had the bad playoff loss after the win in Philadelphia and haven't won anything since. And that seven and two start was more of an aberration because of the fact of some of the plays that went our way and some of the things that didn't go our way. But a lot of the things went our way. I can think of the two interceptions called back in Jacksonville that weren't penalties. 
you figure the missed field goal in Tennessee, you know, there, there's, there is so many things that we can run through in that seven and two start that, that, that the giant, the ball, we've said this before, the ball sometimes just bounces your way. And the giant, the ball did that. It bounced the giants way. And, but then in the two, five and one finish, the ball stopped bouncing our way. Luck only gets you so far. And, and what I'm just thinking of, maybe Mara needs to be a little bit more like George. Maybe Mara has to have this, this, he doesn't have to have that, that outward passion that George has that out, that outward, that outward commitment, George, you could tell George was pissed when his teams lost. You could tell if they didn't play well, we've said it before. He would go after players. Mara, the shit, it's the fan. We put up another stinker on opening day and Mara still did. Well, I've got to defend. I'm going to stick with my quarterback. Well, I got to, uh, we got, we're going to, I think everything's going well. Everything's going fine. How about you just get a little bit of passion in you, John? And maybe that's not you, but how about you get a little bit of fucking passion, get out there and say, you know what? We suck. And we put up a stinker and we need to, this is what, as a season ticket holder, I want to hear, we need to do better, not only for the organization, but for the fans. I never hear Mara talk about the fans a lot. The fans are the one that fill that state and the fans are the one that's buy those concessions. The fans are the ones that sits there and has purchases that merchandise. Yeah, I know with the revenue sharing, you're going to be rich either way, but get a get become a little bit more like George show the fact that you believe that the fans are important to this organization. Show the fact that you believe that we are not only putting this product out for the city of New York, but we're putting it out for everyone that supports this team and has supported this team for years. I don't want to he- keep hearing from my owner. Everything's fine. Everything's good. Everything's great. Even when things suck, I would like a little George. I would like a little Steinbrenner basically just coming out and saying, you know what? Yeah, this fucking sucks. We have to do better. We have to be better. And a lot of times we, we, I just, I just don't see that from this ownership. It's almost like they expect the fans to come back and the fans to continue to watch a horrendous product. And that's what kind of pisses me off. You can say whatever you want about Jerry Jones. You could say how he hasn't won anything in years, but you know what? At the end of the day, his teams are still competitive. The, the Dallas Cowboys are, are still have been a competitive organization for a long time while they may not be able to get over the playoff hump, which is fine. Well, it's not fine, <laughs> but you know, it's still, you know, that pisses Jerry off. Think about it. 12 and five, 12 and five, 12 and five. Then they had the six and 10, eight and eight days, but then they had 10 and six, nine and seven, 13 and three, four and 12. But then they had the 12 and four, eight and eight, eight and eight, eight and eight and six and 10. So you have that stretch between 10 and 13. And what did they have? What did, what did he have? What, how many did it? One, two, three, four, five, six. And they won the division six times going back to 2014. Yeah, they they lost in divisions. They they lost in the wild card. They did all these things. That's yeah. But you know what? They still made it. They were still there. They still got over the hump. And you could tell Jerry gets pissed when he doesn't win, like George. But I just don't see that from Mara. What I see from Mara is everything's awesome. Everything's great. But don't worry about it because we should be okay. Because we have Daniel Jones, and I still believe in this. I still believe in in the quarterback in this. If my team on the 100th anniversary celebration, your top 100 players in the stadium, full house, 72 degrees, opening day, opening day, open, you know, you're kicking off the season and you put up a stinker against the Minnesota Vikings as an owner, I would come out and say, George would have came out and said, this is not fucking acceptable. Instead, we don't, we, we get shit. And now we have to hope that we can go up and beat a Washington team, which is probably on the same level as us, if not a little bit better. 
I want to quickly just talk about the, the, uh, the keys to the defense in this Washington game, because I, I think like, I, I, this is what, this again is another one of these games that I think the giants can win it. I, I think they are of course at the, the, uh, there are, uh, they are of course on the road. They are playing the commanders on the, you know, kicking off their season at home. Uh, I still like to coach Dan Quinn. I think Jane Daniels is the, um, is the guy right now. Vegas has this as two and a point, two and a half point dogs to this team. Um, I think the key, I and mean, we're going to talk about the keys of the offense defense and the keys of the offense. The keys of the defense for the New York giants here is basically to once again, maintain and stop the running game, figure it out because with Austin Eckler, and what's his name? And uh, I can never, I can never remember the, I, I can never remember the one kid, uh, the the run. I can't even think of the name. Of the, I can't think of the name of the running back today. <laughs> That's how pissed off I am. Brian Robinson Jr. You have some good. You have two good backs, and I believe they had seven catches for 110 yards last week as well. But I think the position of every team offensively on the, in this league going up against our defense is going to think the same thing. You just go after the Giants. You just go after the Giants and you attack them with the run, and you attack them on the edge. We saw, we basically, you know, when basically we, we saw, uh, you know, we saw Minnesota do it. We saw, you know, a 29-year-old Aaron Robinson, who's a couple years removed from his best season, get 90-something yards on 16 carries. It's, it's because of the fact that our ends can't play the run very well. And if you think their pass rush of the Giants is their strength, especially from the edge, you know what you do? You run right at the edge. You attack the edge, plain and simple. And that's what teams are going to do all year long until the Giants figure out a way to maintain their assignments, hold the edge, and have some type of linebacking presence that can mop up if someone gets into the second level. And that's not going to be Isaiah Simmons. So if you're the Giants, you're going to need to figure that out. You're going to need to contain Brian Robinson and Austin Eckler. And you're also going to need to follow them and contain it out of the, out of the backfield. We didn't play against a good tight end on Sunday, but we're going to play. We're going up against Zach Ertz. Zach Ertz is not the player that he was, you know, back in the, you know, go, going, going back to the 16 to, uh, you know, to 2020. He's, he's not that guy anymore, but he's still a viable threat in the middle of the field. And you're going to have to hope that Bobby O'Karake and whomever else is going to be in the linebacker course going to have the ability to stay with them. Same with the fact that you're going to have to have the ability to look out for Terry McLaurin. You got I like Luke McCaffrey. I like Luke McCaffrey a lot. I liked him coming out a lot. I thought that was I thought that would have been an interesting pickup for the Giants if they didn't go the direction that they went into. Um, but you have some guys on the outside as well that are gonna put a challenge into your young defensive back. So Dory Jackson's gonna have to step up a little bit better. You're gonna have to get a little bit better at uh, Deontay Banks, and your safeties are gonna have to make sure once again they don't get lulled into. Uh, a little bit of false sense of security and get beat deep again. I kept saying it before the, the, the Minnesota game was going to be very simple. Minnesota. If I was them, I would run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, lure the safeties up and then try to get them past the defense which they did. And when you have some speedsters like the Redskin, the Redskins, I want to say Redskins that what the Washington team has, you know, you, you're, you're gonna, you, you can't fall for that bait. And the Giants are going to have to be a little bit more well-maintained. They're going to have to hold their assignments. They're going to have to figure out exactly where McLaurin is. They're going to have to worry about both Brian Robinson and Austin Eckler because I think they're going to attack him with a run right away. And the other issue is you're going to have to contend with Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels, you know, why he he didn't have an interception. I think he completed like almost 60% of his passes, ran for 88 yards. He, You know what they're going to do with Jaden? It's going to be very simple. Because of the fact that you are going to probably have some over-aggressiveness and they're going to over-pursue on the edge between Burns and Thibodeau, you're just going to run Jaden Daniels up the middle. You are going to create an opportunity or a gap in the middle of that defense. Maybe not going towards Dexter Lawrence, but you are going to go off tackle and you are going to allow him to use his feet and use his wheels and use his speed to get on the outside. And then what's going to happen is when they do that a few times, the giants are going to get less aggressive and then Jaden's going to go over the top and he's going to hit McLaurin or Luke McCaffrey for a big play. 
So the giants are going to have to be a lot more disciplined defensive team. The secondary is going to have to figure out a way to hold their assignments and make sure we, you know, I, I, I hate, I hate the Shane Bowen defense. I've said this before. I hate it in Tennessee. I don't like it here. It's the bend, not break. He's never had a good secondary outside of the two years with Jim Schwartz. It's just, it just doesn't work at times. And the full and the philosophy that we have right now and the team and the, and the, the actual players that we have right now do not fit the system. We I've said it before and I've said it again. We are a cut and paste team. We're cutting and paste players into a system that doesn't work. We are not tailoring the system to the play. We're not tailoring the system to the players. We're trying to tailor the players to the system. And I think we're going to have issues defensively quite a bit. Now I'm not overly, I'm not, you know, like I said, I'm not in love with the offensive line of the commander. So you figure you're going to be able to get that push. But if you all of a sudden start getting this over aggressiveness, because people are going to over commit, you are going to get killed by McLaurin, by McCaffrey, by Robinson jr. By Eckler and by Jaden Daniels, Jaden Daniels. I have this scary, suspicious feeling that Jaden Daniels is going to set this team up. He's going to look like he's going to go. He looks like he's going to take off. The safety is going to come up and McLaurin's going to be sitting there 40 yards down the field, wide open. I have, I, that's what scares the bejesus out of me. We'll talk about what the Giants defense offense has to do to try to get some points on Friday. And as always, please like, please subscribe. Help out the channel. I want to thank everyone that dropped in on the live stream yesterday. That was a lot of fun. And as always, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to ring that bell. You want to know why? That'll be awesome.